begin the webinar. So um, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to everyone joining us today. I'm Cynthia Gares, the coordinator of the steering committee of the Stakeholder Advisory Network on Climate Finance, also known as the SAN. And I'm very pleased to be welcoming you today to our webinar number four. Um, this is number four of SAN's five-part virtual forum. And today's webinar will look at the SAN's legal arrangements and membership. Um, and very importantly, what the value addition of a SAN membership is to you, all of our membership and other stakeholders. Um, and so without uh, further ado, I would like to right away um, introduce to you our esteemed moderator for the day. Um, it's Mr. Brian Loisey. Um, he is the executive director of the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce and Industry in the West Indies. And Brian has over 25 years of experience in development work in both the public and private sector. He has been active in the fields of private sector development, advocacy, business support services, trade negotiations, export development, sustainable development, uh, development planning, and competitiveness. And I'd like to add that um, very importantly, Brian is a former observer, a climate fund observer for the Climate Investment Fund, and he is a current member of the SAN. Now, in his role as an observer, Brian saw and still sees his role as being critical to um, ensuring that the private sector of the Caribbean region is involved in the dialogue and awareness of issues of climate change and that uh, these are taken into account and their impact and broader environmental issues and um, decision making and business planning are also taken into account. And so one last thing I'd like to say about Brian before I turn it over to him is I'd also like to mention that Brian, uh, who has done such great work in St. Lucia, is also a recipient of the Officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, an OBE. He received this in 2016 for his brilliant work, um, for his service to the public and private sectors. And so, Brian, with that, I'd like to turn it over to you to uh, introduce uh, our webinar. Thank you. <coughs> Brian, you're still on mute. Yes, sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Cynthia, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for having me on this program. I was saying I'm not sure if you should have spoken too much about that OBE, because my favorite aunt, loving aunt, playfully suggests that the OBE stands for, in my case, one bad example. So I'm not sure she knows me better than many, but um, no, thank you very much for having me here and for inviting me to be part of um, this very important dialogue. Um, I, I continue to serve as the Executive Director of the Sydney Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture, um, even after 20 years. And I've been a former Climate Fund Observer with the Climate Investment Fund, and I served there from 2012. Whilst I was there, I worked on a number of different projects with the government of St. Lucia, including in, in, the, in the climate um, change area, including seeing the award and commencement of the St. Lucia Disaster Risk Reduction Project, which focuses on building resilience in national infrastructure um, and looks at um, strengthening key bridges, um, health and educational facilities, to name a few of the areas. I was also able to kickstart climate adaptation projects in agriculture, where we promoted climate resilient and smart agricultural practices. Um, the chamber has placed climate change and disaster risk reduction as a major area of focus. And as such, over the last few years, we have hosted numerous educational 
and, award, and awareness building programs ranging from business continuity planning, resilient investment, and investing and using insurance as part of the risk mitigation strategies of business. In many institutions, much of our work program and funding has gone south with the COVID-19 pandemic response. Yet we have continued to utilize this very pandemic to demonstrate the importance of business continuity and resilience. The Chamber has led in the establishment of the Arise Network in St. Lucia with the support of the National Emergency Management Office and the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Office. Uh, today, I'm still an observer. Because I'm a member of the Stakeholder Advisory Network on Climate Finance, the SAM welcomes past, current, and future observers to its network to share ideas, experiences, transfer technical knowledge, learn about new tools and perspectives, and to be part of a community of stakeholders that endeavor to enhance good governance and the effectiveness of climate finance for beneficiaries as well as the climate and environmental firms. Today's webinar is part of a five part webinar series of virtual forums organized to inform and engage the SAN membership and other stakeholders in discussion and consultation around the purpose of the SAN's five working groups, which are governance and elections, products and services, resource mobilization, legal arrangements, and of course, membership. These working groups are helping strengthening the capacity of SANS members, solidifying the SANS governance structure, identifying ways to build knowledge gaps, and bring the SAN closer to full oper oper operationalization. More specifically, today's webinar will look at the SANS legal arrangements and the value addition of SAN membership. The first segment looks at what, best, what the best options are for hosting locations or a home for SAN. The SAN bylaws, the SAN's budget, pro bono work being done for the SAN by a law firm and a high tech company and a proposed MOU. The second segment looks at who the SAN members are and how they are identified and discusses the forthcoming first ever SAN membership survey. Um, I've been asked to share a little bit of what's happening back home in St. Lucia. Um, I thought of being um, mean and do this webinar from the beach. We are a small island state that comes with all of the climate change challenges of small, small islands, coupled with the ever prevalent challenges of the COVID-19 on its society and economy. We have had to respond exceedingly quickly and drastically to the threat of COVID-19. Our economy is wide open. 80% of the economy is dependent on tourism. So that means exposure to international travel and international trade. In late March, the government moved quickly to implement a scale down of, of non-essential commercial activities to restrict movements of persons around the country, instituted a curfew that limited movement at night to the early morning, and also closed the borders to international travel. We have seen 19 COVID cases, 18 have recovered. The last one only showed up a week ago, and that was from a returning national who had been on one of the cruise ships. All returning nationals coming into St. Lucia are placed into a quarantine facility, which some of my friends from the United States and Germany have said they wish to come home because the hotel is on, the facility is at a hotel on the beach. Um, so we spend, Reserve National spend two weeks in there. But our economy has been ravaged because tourism has virtually collapsed. All hotels have closed down and we haven't had a, a visitor since the end of March. Over 14,000 people were employed in the tourism, in the hotel industry, and these have all been laid off. Added to that, 70% of my members who responded to a survey on the impact of COVID suggested that they could not exist in a zero tourism economy for more than six months. This is how dependent we are on the tourism industry. But we are also very vulnerable to hurricanes, to tsunamis, and earthquakes. 
us as a vulnerable economy, we have done all that we can to protect our society's health from the COVID virus by restricting the movement of people, restricting entry into our country, and putting some very successful contact tracing methods that have worked to safeguard our populace. Since two weeks ago, we have started to reopen our economy and the society slowly. Curfews are being relaxed and businesses are now back in operation. This was done in a very deliberate phased manner where every two weeks, an additional sector was opened up, allowing the government time to see what is happening over two weeks and decide whether there was an increase in spread or any spread at all. We have thus been very fortunate because of our proactive stance. Notwithstanding, we see very tough times ahead with the government seeing a drastic reduction in revenue from over $100 million monthly to just over $60 million monthly. This places us in some very precarious and difficult circumstances. But we are positive that we have the capacity, we have the determination and the intellect to take our country forward and overcome. Having said all of this, I'd like to turn over to our first presenter, Andrea Baca, an international private sector and sustainable sustainability consultant, formerly with the International Chamber of Commerce and former Green Climate Fund Observer. Currently, she's the Climate Investment Fund Observer and SANS Steering Committee member. Andrea, over to you. Thank you very much, Brian. So, um, I, we will start with uh, some introductory slides, and I'm aware that some of you have seen them already, but uh, we will represent uh, them shortly to ensure that everybody has the same uh, level of uh, knowledge on where we are currently. And again, uh, just to, uh, to welcome, I see that, uh, of course, Light and I, myself, we are here leading the legal working group, but I see Patrick is also online, who has been very supportive of our legal group. So um, thank you very much, uh, also Patrick, for joining. Um, so to come to the slide you're seeing now, as you see, 2016, really, we had our, well, in, informal official launch at the COP. Uh, 22 uh, Morocco. We were very lucky. We had um, several Sun members, uh, different Sun observers, and one of our speakers was Mary Robinson, the former Prime Minister of Ireland, and now many of you know her foundation. So the launch of the Sun was very successful and very well perceived at the COP22. Since then, we had uh, two assemblies uh, in 2017 and 2018. We have always tried to hold them back to back to ensure maximum participation. Our assembly plan in 2019 had to be postponed twice, unfortunately, once uh, because of the change of the COP from Chile to Spain uh, and for the COVID 19 reason. But here, yeah, as we will speak later, planning the uh, this year, early um, autumn. And now we are in. Uh, transition phase, as you can see, since uh, 2019, we're fundraising our strategy, our working groups, uh, uh, reaching out, uh, coordinating, um, consulting, um, and so on. So we are currently at this stage in between, and today you will hear a lot more about what are the options to establish the sun uh, legally. And we can go to the next slide. There you can see a little in more detail uh, what we're doing actually right now. Um, is we, as you, those of you who have participated in the webinar before, we have created five working groups on the different on different topics: election, membership, product services, legal arrangement, uh, resource mobilization, um, and to really work on the different topics we need to establish the sun and to move forward towards its autonomy and maximum impact to ensure effective participation of observers to the fund and really support the funds and observers to participate effectively in the fund uh, as well. Uh, and currently, we are looking very much on the external side, so we are really in progress to ask your feedback, your comments. The webinars is one, uh, one means for us to uh, consult you, ask your feedback, uh, also as a means for us to adapt, to uh, respond better to uh, your uh, needs and requests, 
and then be, of course, finalized uh, towards the General Assembly for final approval by the Membership Council. And with this, actually, I hand over to Lat, who will uh, provide you some more details on the legal options. And we will then continue to show you also a bit more how the structure um, would look like of the sun. Let it is for you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and thank you to Brian for moderating. Thank you for, to all of you for joining. Um, legal and, and hosting arrangements aren't necessarily an inspiring topic, uh, if, uh, but they are a necessary one. So, you know, this is really about some, some pragmatic arrangements. Uh, I would say if you want some inspiration, I can recommend the Climate Investment Fund's Heat of the Moment podcast. Uh, I was just listening to that this morning and uh, some really um, great stories about, uh, you know, what's happening uh, out in the world. Um, you know, the story today was on, on uh, uh, drip irrigation in Niger. And, and so there are solutions out there. And I think those are the kinds of things we need to keep in mind as we're working on, on these issues. Um, but so turning to you know the organization of the SAN, uh, you know really the the objective of the SAN is is for climate finance observers to promote more effective climate finance, and and this objective is enshrined in in some of its documents in in our uh, in the original trust fund committee uh, resolution and in the strategy. Um, so you know we are about inclusion and transparency and accountability, promoting those. Uh, ensuring that there is proper review of climate finance projects and safeguards and partnership and collaboration among all non-state climate finance actors. And I think that really is a value added of the SAN because other, um, you know, uh, networks are, you know, tend to work more, uh, you know, separately as climate uh, um, civil society, indigenous peoples, and, and private sector. And so the SAN is trying to bring together all non-state actors. Um, now, as I mentioned, the, the, the SAN has gone through some evolution. On the right-hand side of this slide, you can see the evolution from the trust fund committee to the strategy. Um, and we, we've, we've gone through additional steps. We, we've, we've made a fundraising effort, which um, has not resulted in funds, but we have had some outreach, and I think we now have you know, uh, the SAN name is out there among uh, potential funders. So that's a positive thing. And a really positive development in terms of organization has been the establishment of five working groups of which legal and hosting arrangements is, is one. Um, so on the, on the bottom half of, that, of this slide, you really see how this has gone. You know, what the people involved, um, we've had uh, the steering committees, we've had the legal arrangements working group, um, and, and the point of this is to lead to an institutionalized SAN. Uh, now, um, if you're talking about a person being institutionalized, that's not a good thing. That means you're crazy. But uh, this, this would mean the SAN has an institutional foundation, um, uh, which would be uh, a, a set of documents that, that are um, established. And let's go to the next slide, and we'll go more into that. So this is about the SAN's uh, legal status and uh, legal and status options. Um, and on the on the on the left-hand side, you see, um, you know, we're looking at a couple of different solutions for the medium and uh, for the short and medium term. Um, the current reality is that the, the SAN has been um, supported uh, solely by the climate investment funds, and so essentially the the, the CIF is the host of, of the SAN, um, and uh, people like Cynthia uh, have been supported by the SAN and Andres. And, um, you know, there, there, is, there are benefits to this. Uh, you know, the, obviously the Climate Investment Funds is, is um, I, I guess, the, the second largest uh, climate fund out there. It's, it, it's uh, you know, got strong credibility. Um, on the other hand, with you know some uh, elements of civil society and and um, other organizations that that would mean uh, that it's 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 compromised um, and and the fact is is that we we don't have that much autonomy in in terms of having a budget uh, um, so one of the steps that we can take that is um, expedient 
um, is to uh, be hosted by a fiscal sponsor. Um, now, this would normally imply that we've got some other funding outside of the SIF, um, but, but this would allow us to function uh, without setting up a whole back office. Um, so you essentially have an instant back office, all the financial, administrative, human uh, resources, and, and IT support that we would need. Um, we've developed a, a memorandum of understanding, um, and uh, you know, the, the, the only downsides of this are that, uh, number one, well, there's a 7% fee on funds raised. Number two, there are possible things that, that the host organization that we, uh, that we identified um, after um, fairly strong outreach uh, resolve, they have done uh, some services for the SIF. And so, you know, there are questions, would that be a conflict of interest? I, you know, I, it, it's not necessarily that is the case. Um, so looking longer term, though, the, the real goal of, of uh, our, our legal arrangements work is to develop the SAN as a separate institution, an independent nonprofit entity, which would have full autonomy. Um, uh, and this, you know, the, the downsides of this are that, you know, we have to have bylaws, we have to have officers, uh, so we'd have to have... Um, you know, the proper documentation, we'd have to have people step up to take those responsibilities. Um, so, but we, I think a final point about this is that these options are not mutually exclusive. So we're actually pursuing all three of these at the same time. We've maintained our dialogue with the SIF. We have maintained a dialogue with Resolve and, and got very close to a final MOU. And we are now working towards um, becoming an independent entity. Let's, let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that we need to, to become independent is uh, a set of bylaws. Um, they are, they're needed for our own governance to, to really uh, establish our governance and to uh, be part of our documents of incorporation. Um, they're not the same as articles of incorporation, but, but they would be kind of uh, part, part of them. Um, now the bylaws that we are uh, considering would be based on the, the SAN launch, that's the, um, that's the trust fund committee document and prior general assemblies. Uh, so there's the concept note and the SAN strategy and action plan. And um, so the, the bylaws would be based on existing texts and the coordinating committee election, and um, then new elements that may need to be added, such as officers, the role of officers um, that we haven't currently addressed. And that would then be approved um, by the General Assembly. Let's go to the next slide. So this is um, a fairly recent development. We now uh, have uh, engaged a, a law firm for legal support of the SAN. Uh, this is a pro bono arrangement, meaning that they are offering their services for free. So it may be surprising that we need uh, a, a law firm to support us, but uh, uh, lawyers are, um, uh, have special skills. And uh, you know, a, a primary thing here is that to exist legally, the SAN needs to be incorporated. So without, without incorporation, um, for example, the SAN cannot receive funds independently um, it, it, you know, outside of, say, a hosting arrangement. Um, so this is something that we need to set up uh, for the future if it is to be independent. Um, you know, we've, we, we began this process uh, last year um, uh, fairly early on, and uh, we worked through referral, um, and we, the first law firm that we contacted eventually declined to provide the support. Um, fortunately, we, we got in touch with a second law firm uh, that reply, replied very quickly and uh, provided a signed letter of engagement on, on May 29th. So um, it's been uh, about two weeks that we've had this in place. Um, they are still reviewing uh, documents that, that we have provided them. Um, so the, the firm is, is Freed, Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson. It's a, a, a highly 
uh, esteemed and well-known law firm uh, based in the United States, but also with offices in Europe. And, and we met with them uh, just last week. Um, and so what are they going to do? There are, there are four things that they are able to help us with, which include articles of incorporation. This would be for incorporating in the United States and specifically in the District of Columbia. Um, there are certain advantages to, to that. Um, there are bylaws uh, that they, they will help us, bylaws. Uh, they will do a legal review of the re MOU with health, and they will help us actually see after those things with the application for nonprofit status. Uh, of course, these documents um, will be reviewed um, by the coordinating committee and approved by the SAN membership. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, another element, of course, is the SAN budget. Uh, as some of you may be aware, the SAN does not have a separate line in the, in the Climate Investment Fund's uh, administrative budget. Uh, however, the SAN has developed its own draft budget and business plan uh, that, that goes out three years. Um, and I think that is you know, quite a, a robust document. Um, we have requested funding from the Climate Investment Funds for fiscal years 20, which is coming to an end, and FY21, which would run through June 30th of next year. Um, and the, the things that we included in that were funding for uh, General Assembly to support our election, uh, coordinator, a foundational study and a follow-up study, communication support, which includes these webinars, a website, uh, very important um, for us to have an independent website, things like translations, and potential travel costs if, um, if people are meeting uh, in person as opposed to virtually. So that uh, is still, um, we believe, under uh, discussion with the, with the SIF. Um, we, we hope to have further discussion with the Climate Investment Funds on those requests. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ned. Um, so what you will see at the next slide is uh, a little our development on a membership and uh, our working groups and the steering group. Now, on the first glance, it looks very similar, but it's actually quite different to the slide you have seen a few minutes uh, ago. Um, so, in the middle, of course, you see our key founding vision, uh, governance basis, which is really formed around inclusivity, collaboration, co creation, and partnership. And of course, this is really the key to the sun also to be successful. So we are very much aware of the importance to ensure these four uh, basics, which we have integrated in our strategy document since the beginning of the sun, actually. And while, of course, we all look forward that the sun is uh, rather sooner than later established, we do recognize that the process and ensuring inclusivity and, and the buy-in of everybody and all funds is as important as the final product to ensure our, the success of the sun, which, as I mentioned previously, um, is really the idea of being a kind of an umbrella organization working together on topics where all fund observers feel we can benefit from each other's expertise, um, sharing um, practices, or, or improving the fund's governance, or help the funds maybe to work better with, with us. So it's really uh, not replacing any fund structure in itself, but it works together on where we have synergies and where we can benefit from each other's um, knowledge and uh, participation. Um, of course, at the beginning when we started, the uh, SUN was uh, at a steering committee um, a group, which was particular was mainly formed out of the CIF observer because it was really coming out as an idea from uh, the CIF and has since then evolved and has broadened its membership. Um, and again, I see some of the different funds of server being uh, also present today. So thank you very much for, for joining again today. Um, and then with really the aim of the coordinating committee, um, which elections will start shortly, which has to be represented by throughout um, observer from the different funds. So all funds need to be represented in the coordinating committee and also all the different uh, stakeholder groups. 
Uh, so this is very important. And um, you have received uh, the presentations from uh, the last webinar where we explained this in more detail. But if you have questions on that um, later on, um, please be free to ask us questions and we will have, we'll be happy to re respond. Um, on the next slide, you see really a very short or overview of how the organization chart of the sun should look like. So it's a, a very classic setup, as you know, from uh, your own organizations and other networks. It's really with a, a members council, which is the decision making body, if you want, the coordinating committee as the executive body. There will be working groups, a coordinator who is looking after the day by day to day um, activities, and of course, the linkages to the different funds. Um, to ensure really uh, that we can benefit from each other's knowledge and best practice sharing. Um, but again, it's a very classic organization as probably most of you are very much aware of. And at the next slide, uh, for those interested to read a bit more, we have uh, written it. You will receive the PowerPoint in more detail, where again you can see the Members Council, which is really the backbone uh, of the organization, which is uh, all members so all, uh, who is participating, who will approve really the, the bylaws, the governance, key decisions, the work plan, etc. Again, the coordinating committee who is the executive body who will support the implementation of the strategy and the coordinator who is really there for the day-to-day -day activities um, and exchanges uh, with, uh, around the different SAN activities. Um, so this is, uh, and we are actually close to working like this already now. Uh, the difference is that now we are really moving as LightSec into the formalization of the sun, and this will be established in a, in a very um, classic organization structure with, as you heard from LED, the bylaws, um, with clear uh, um, terms of reference for the different bodies, who is doing what, who can do what, uh, how will we be organized, how often the General Assembly will be organized, etc. So all of this will be more formalized, uh, but we are already working on that line uh, currently. And with this, I hand it over to Cynthia, who has been working a lot on to establish and help us uh, to establish the sun. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Andrea. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, please. The next slide, thank you very much. So um, this is very specifically the work of the SAN um, Working Group on Membership. Um, this particular working group, um, I see a couple of people here from the working group. Um, unfortunately, Sorrow and Grace, the, the leaders of this working group, um, aren't able to be here today, but I am going to talk through all of the um, the work and the outputs that we have been uh, uh, trying to uh, trying to um, bring to fruition since last October. So right now on this side, slide, you see um, a snapshot of the SAN membership database. Why is this important? Well, we have about 180 people in that database. And you can see, if you look down towards the bottom here, where it's blown up a bit, it's very specific to, um, this is Sorrow, uh, his profile in our database. So you can see how it's been mapped out. Um, we have his email, his name. Importantly, if he has been a SIF uh, um, observer, and it tells us which of the SIF funds he was or currently is in. It tells us that he was in another fund. So previously, Saro had been with and he also part of the SAN steering committee. Um, then we have a type, which is about the constituency. Um, is it CSO? Is it Indigenous Peoples? Is it private sector? Saro is uh, an Indigenous um, persons observer. Um, and then his title, president of uh, the movement uh, for the survival of the Ongoni people. Um, he's active, um, at least in the SAN, not in the JEF, um, and in the SIF. He's actually still a, an active SIF observer. Um, and he's part of a working group 
the working group on membership and as well as the working group on um, governance and elections. He's also part of our thematic group, um, which uh, we just sort of launched right before we were going to head out to Nairobi. Um, you probably all are aware that we're going to be holding our last General Assembly and Forum in Nairobi, and that was canceled because of COVID-19. So um, right before that, we had um, launched a number of thematic groups. So Saro is uh, part of the Indigenous People Thematic Group. Um, he's from Nigeria. And um, if I scroll down, I think he started, I can't see it, something's blocking. <laughs> you all can probably see it. He either um, was first began in 2012 or 2015. I'm sorry, I can't see it. But um, this is how we've mapped out all about 180 people in our database. Now, the question is, are there more people that should be in our database? Are there people in our database who perhaps um, no longer should be there? Um, perhaps there are people who had been former observers, but they don't want to be active participants. Maybe they would wish to opt out at this time. So how do we go about um, learning more about who you are and uh, what your priorities are? And um, how do we go about doing that? So um, if we can now go to the next slide, please. May we please move to the next slide? <laughs> Perfect, thank you. So this working group not only worked on finessing uh, our, our database um, for membership, we also have devised the first ever SON uh, questionnaire that will be administered to the full SON membership. And why is this exciting? Well, it's because it's the first time we're doing it. We need to know more about you so that we can serve you better. Um, we need to know which products and services you might prefer. We need to know if you consider yourself to be an active member. Maybe you're more of a passive member and you just like to read our updates or a newsletter. Or maybe you really want to um, send in an expression of interest and, and be candidate for the um, coordinated committee election that's just been launched. Um, so let me explain that the initial vision of the SAN was to be extremely inclusive, extremely democratic, and simply by virtue of having been or currently being uh, a climate fund or environment fund observer, you get to be a member of the SAN automatically. So that's why we have a very large collection of people in our database, and there's probably many, many more out there that could be added to this. So, um, and this goes back to our foundational documents. Um, in 2015, as many of you know, um, the SON uh, initially came out of a vision um, uh, by some of the SIF observers um, and, and the SIF AU who saw a need. Um, there were gaps there in capacity, um, a variety of other, other things that needed to be scaled up and addressed. So they thought it'd be wonderful to have this network um, and that just initially, for practical reasons, they would start with the SIF observers. And this was back in 2015 um, when it was uh, officially endorsed by the um, Joint Trust Fund Committee. And in 2016, as Andrea mentioned, we had our official launch um, at COP22. Um, but as you can see here, it was codified in the original document that we uh, that uh, membership will be opened to the broader non-state actors through time. And so over the past four years, that is exactly what has happened. It has been a gradual evolution and development of our membership. So by the time we reached 2018 with our co-created um, strategy document, um, it says the Sun Membership Council is open to all observers, alternates, and active participants of, exact, of existing climate finance networks, past and present, including all indigenous, civil society, and private sector stakeholders, um, et cetera, et cetera. And this includes all of the major funds, the Adaptation Fund, um, the JEF, the GCF, the FCPF, um, the SIF, 
Oops, I hope I haven't missed one. Um, and so gradually, all of these funds, um, observers from across the funds, have been participating in our general assemblies. And um, I don't mean to, to call you up, Julia, but Julia from the Adaptation Fund Network has joined us today. Um, she's been learning a lot about the song by joining our webinar series. Um, and so um, this is where we are. We are still growing. We're still in progress. And we need to have more information from you. So this is why we devised this um, uh, questionnaire that will be um, administered in, in a couple of weeks to all of you. And here's the rationale for the song steering committee and membership working group. We will be able to better understand what is the scope and depth of SON membership, how active is SON membership, what activities do members prioritize, and very importantly, what is the value addition of SON membership? What do you see the added value is to your work? Um, so if you could move to the next slide now, please. Thank you. Value addition. Why should you want to be a member of the SON? What does the SON give you that you don't already have in whatever your current situation is? Um, the network you're in, um, they all have value. But what is it that can add additional value if you are a member of the SON? Well, here in a very high level, we look at it. So there are some common shortfalls that we see as commonalities across many of the observer networks. Um, for example, um, existing network observer groups often lack the mandate or capacity for sustained advocacy to strengthen and harmonize engagement policies and practices across the climate funds. Well, how, what is the solution the Sun has for that? The SON strong network of technical experts from civil society, private sector, and indigenous peoples groups inform the work of the SON and its capacity building products and services. Number two, existing networks, observers, groups rarely communicate across funds, and most have no access to other models of good practice. The SON's uh, value addition, SON's strong network of membership from across the climate funds helps to break down silos, allowing good practices to be shared consistently across the funds and to leapfrog learning from failures. And number three, existing networks, observers, groups routinely replace observers, resulting in loss of institutional knowledge, relationships, and trust between parties. The SANS value addition is, on strong network of past and current observers allows for the transfer of institutional and technical knowledge to those just entering the climate finance space. And I can tell you from interacting with many of the SON members, many of whom go all the way back to 2010, I call them our originals, um, they are still highly engaged. In fact, um, Vidya, I don't know if he's online today, <coughs> excuse me, um, he is an original from 2010, and he worked with us on this membership um, working group, and he thinks that the SON, even to him today, is still something that's very highly valued. Um, so um, with that, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. May we turn to the next slide, please? So this is really, really cool. These are all comments that we received from all of you. So for our first webinar, we did a little poll in the beginning uh, for registration. And we specifically asked, so what do you think the value addition of sound membership is to you? And I've highlighted some of them. Um, collaborating with other observers in civil society. Um, it added value in a sense that it is a forum for peer learning, experience sharing, and contribution to the debate and shape of climate finance issues, bringing different civil society perspectives and contributions to the current and future very important issues that will lead the way on how the world behaves towards the earth sustainably. 
etc. So here you see transparency, learning, sharing, collaboration, capacity building, indigenous peoples organizing, monitoring. These are all the themes that are coming out of this. And um, so I'd like you to think about what you think is the value addition to you. And um, you can use the little chat function on, on the side of your screen here. And you can just write in to everyone what you think um, the sun's value addition would be to you personally and professionally. And um, while you are thinking about that, I'm now going to turn uh, the uh, webinar over to Brian once again. And Brian is going to talk to you about his very personal um, uh, perception of what uh, the song's value addition is. So Brian, over to you. Thank you very much, Cynthia, Andrea, Lad. I want to thank you all for your very eloquent presentation um, and for explaining the process which has got us to where we are. And clearly you would note uh, quite a bit of work has gone in. And I think we really need to applaud um, persons who are primarily volunteers who have put in this time and effort um, to produce and bring us to this, this important juncture. Um, I, was I was invited to be part of the um, CIF and the uh, Observer. And because of what I thought was a hectic schedule, um, I, I, I sort of hemmed and hawed about it for a little while until my staff said, but you know, you're not being consistent. You have um, been speaking about these issues, saying we need to take them on board, government needs to take them more seriously, and here you have an opportunity um, to be part of a, a global movement, and you're, you're not doing it. And so I joined in, and um, I have found great value in being part of it, because especially being from a small institution, a small country, we have we are bomb there's a lot of um information overload we don't have we are time poor we don't have enough time to keep tabs on all that is happening and as pointed out a lot of these um climate funds operate in silos being part of the of, of the sun has brought me into a an organization and, and, and a system that allows me to very easily um follow best practice tap into what others are doing, um, learn from others by um, being, even when I'm being passive, by just observing and following the dialogues and the discussions that are taking place. It has also allowed me to um, share that information with the Caribbean, other Caribbean chambers. We have formed what we call a CARICHAM. That is a network of Caribbean chambers. We have 17 countries and 19 chambers being involved. One of the key pillars of our work we have identified this climate change and disaster risk reduction. And so being part of SAN allows me to speak fairly authoritatively and um, advocate with my government, support my government in the efforts. And when they were talking about a disaster risk and vulnerability um, project, and everybody was saying, you know, well, what about the private sector? I was able to step in and say, hey, look, when you're talking about building more resilient bridges, I'm looking at, uh, river stabilization, slope stabilization. All these things are very important to the business community because that infrastructure and resilient infrastructure means after a hurricane, we are able to continue our business. A few years ago, we had a, a tropical storm. And what we found was that our, our island being mountainous, number of rivers, we had numerous bridges that were destroyed and the island was almost cut in half as far as um, communication and transportation. But again, when the ideas of these projects came about, the private sector was able to stand up and support government and say, hey, look, this is all part of our resilience building. And that type of information and observer status allowed me to monitor how the projects were being processed, what was being taken account of. I could then advocate to my government with a great bit of um, information and, and for knowledge. And so I think that I'm remaining involved in SAN gives me an opportunity to understand what is happening, follow what's happening, network with experts, and, 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 and I think the objective of bringing these multitude of climate funds into one coherent group where we could understand what is happening, 
gives us a better opportunity as private sector to link in and understand and, and wade through the maze of institutions that we really do not have time to do um, without the SAN. So I really want to say that um, the SAN has, has real value to my work, real value to my ability to speak and support those important initiatives because I have the information, I have the insight, and I have um, a whole huge network supporting me. Um, I wish to open up the floor um, to discussions at this point and um, invite members to make the comments or to ask questions and to make the contributions. Important question, what does SANS value addition mean to you? Um, I see someone has made um, observer standards and checklists, observer capacity building. Um, someone has made a point. San, someone has made a point. San is a voice of climate funds. Any other contributions? Why are you participating in SAN? Well, what, what are the real, um, what inspires you to take the time to engage and be involved? Hello, everyone. Here's again, Andrea. I see Mohamed. I saw you raise your hand. I think you wanted to make a comment. Mohamed? Yes, Mohamed. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, this uh, a wonderful presentation, but in fact, I will try to club three presentations and very important points that not only the lead uh, and the entria and yourself, in fact, have uh, uh, you know raised. Uh, for me, uh, as far as the value addition to your network is concerned, I think that uh, instead of focusing and looking inward approach and adopting inward approach, looking always to the CIF for the fundraising and finance. We also need to reach and uh, to uh, the international corporate houses, for instance, 500 global fortune companies, they may be approached. Uh, the uh, the uh, big organizations like uh, Unilever, uh, like Nestle, like Bill Gates Foundation, uh, but all will happen uh, first of all, our own the SAN network is accredited by the umbrella organization, which is very important. So uh, we need to, because when we'll be involving these organizations, so probably we shall have <clears throat> a corporate head led uh, value addition and knowledge uh, that will help us to expand the scope of uh, uh, the SAN network. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mohammed. Um, I think your suggestion that we look broader than just the typical funders is very important. Because I, I do think that um, also the, um, the large companies, as part of the corporate social responsibility, they are understanding that taking care of the environment is an integral component. And it's actually, um, it, it's good for business. And where they can actively support, they actively see returns. And I think we need to um, expand and take, and take up that suggestion. And in our, in our search for support, we need to find, we need to look at some of these alternative um, funding sources. Thank you very much. Brian, I, I can also comment on that. Um, and. Uh... This is Lad. Um, thank you, Mohammed, for that suggestion. I mean, a, and uh, certainly it is a good suggestion. I guess it's a question of timing. Um, you know, we, we thought we'd start kind of where we are, and, um, you know, we are already known among the 
climate funds. So, you know, and and we're also already known among some of the, the bilateral donors. So we felt that the door was at least partly open uh, in those areas, um, whereas with, uh, with the foundations and, and with the private sector, um, it's it's a bit more of a of a long term game, and I think for us to have established uh, some basis, maybe beyond just the SIF, for us to then have greater credibility when we go to those. But, but it's it's a it's a suggestion and definitely on our radar. It's just a question of I guess sequencing how we how we do that. Thank you. I also think that um, one of the um, things that helps us build credibility, I think, would be the, if we, how we can link the products and services that are being developed. Because when um, institutions can speak to these products and services and show the impact and value of these, it raises the profile of the, the, of, of the, of the SAN having developed these, and thus, again, we, you, there, 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 there'll be a quicker buy-in for brand um, brand attachment and and, and brand um, support, and and I do I do agree that um, you start with what you know, um, and and the, the, these um, I do I don't like the phrase these days no hanging fruit, um, the fact that we are known um, the door is open people are expecting people are, are know of you, um, it is more it's, it's an easier um, effort at the, at, especially at the initial stage as we're building our own capacity and institution. Hello, here's also Andrea. Um, maybe just to comment also on, I, I read, uh, Julia, I read your comment uh, on the comment box where you mentioned that you're still in discussing discussion, the adaptation fund um, about the sun and that you are here to participate above all to understand better how we will work. And um, I think beyond that, we probably should have a bilateral follow-up. As we mentioned, the sun is not, uh, it's meant as a kind of um, to work like an umbrella, if you want, for the different funds. And we would work together as non stakeholders where we have a joint interest and where we can benefit from each other's synergies. Um, so it is not meant in any form to um, replace any of the big um, fund. Um, a governance structure, which anyway work uh, work very well, but it's really designed. For example, myself, I've been member of nearly every um, of a lot of different funds, if it's the CHF, the TCF, or the SIF. And for example, I felt, and also when when I work for the Chamber of Commerce for the membership, it was very difficult to understand that every fund has a complete different way of functioning. So for the private sector, it was sometimes very difficult to participate uh, effectively because every fund works completely different. Uh, and for each fund, we needed like a specific capacity building and a, a specific outreach. Um, and it's, it's a lot of work. And the idea was, for example, couldn't we look what is the best practice, um, how non-stakeholder could be engaged so we can participate very effectively? Uh, how can we not lose in our institutional memory um, and what we have learned. So it's really more working together where we as a group, as a whole, uh, can make an impact and make a positive change uh, to make climate fund, uh, finance work in a, in a better way. So it's really the, the synergy where we focus. Um, so I hope that's a bit more clear, but please ask more questions, Julia, if, if you have, and then we should anyway have a bilateral uh, follow-up. Thank you. Um, very good point, Andrea, because um, earlier, before we started the meeting, Cynthia and I were having a bilateral where I was telling one of my um, actual um, interventions I was seeking to get developed was funding for um, our chamber and the chambers in the region to have a resource that would allow us to sift through these various funds, understand what are the requirements, what are the areas of focus, what is the process accessing these funds because we just couldn't do it. It was just too confusing. There are just too many. And, and, and the fact that the, the, the SAN brings all these funding funds together allows us to communicate and share. We build products and tools that could help us sit through that. It's extremely important and useful. And it could also point us to which are the funds that probably are best suited 
to help us address the issue we are seeking to and show us some examples and best practice of how these funds could be accessed. But also importantly, I think um, we shouldn't underestimate the value of having civil society speaking and sharing ideas and concerns on a single platform. Often we are apart where um, indigenous people, maybe private sector, maybe um, climate interests, um, social groups, disadvantaged persons are speaking individually and they see each other as either as competitors or as insensitive, as not understanding. And most of the time, it's simply because we don't understand and we're not speaking the same language, but the objectives and the interests are the same. So having all these different civil society together is, is extremely useful in my experience. Um, I'm reading through the chat here. I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing the question. Um, networking is important to monitor climate investments, to know which are working and improving the standard, standards for climate investment. Very true. In developing countries, I've seen, I don't see climate investment that are really successful. Um, well, we, we need to talk about that by see, um Senna has raised the hand. Please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed this too. And, uh, and that time, uh, remember some of the discussion we had in Madrid and the COP. Uh, let, let me just throw these few questions and concerns. Uh, that did the best to respond. and. Uh, I, I went and con tried to convince my, my fellow because uh, again and again, uh, some of the climate activists and suicide organizations, particularly from Africa, are a bit worried about this uh, continuous effort by some of our northern friends to keep creating networks and, and uh, clubs that we don't really feel connected to. And we can see. Uh, Recently, there's a, there are more and more southern and Africa-based uh, climate justice movement being created as a way to respond to those global movements. And I, I don't see some sitting really in that kind of concern that uh, some of my friends are raising. But still, I am concerned about how we are going to put into perspective so that people can understand who we are and who we are not. Uh, in the uh, slide that uh, Renata is sharing, I can see point number 10. It's in French. It's not being underlined. But what the colleague is trying to say is that something like capacity building for our work. So is it, uh, is our colleague writing in French a right to say, I expect them to come and build my capacity or not? So what are we going to do? What are we not going to do? So I think this part of exclusive list of things we are, what we not, probably might have to dispense some of the concern people are having. But again, I'm pointing out the fact that uh, for now, sun is being perceived for, from some of our colleagues here as something really northern, a new movement, a new club of friends, trying to chop money, like, uh, to be very honest. Uh, that's how it's perceived. Um, secondly, uh, I, I decided a lot about how possible it can be to decentralize, uh, for instance, the um, fiscal support work. Uh, I appreciate the work that has, been, that has been done in connecting some of the other groups in the, the state. But already here we are again uh, seeing some justification to our concerns that, oh, here they go. They started uh, like uh, creating roots in Washington. So again, this is going to be a sign, going to be another Washington-based uh, um, organization. So uh, how can we respond? And finally, finally uh, as you know, some of the regional banks, uh, the FGB, are, are regional implementers of the CIF fund. It's not the same for other funds I know. But uh, those banks have their own observers. And uh, I, I don't want to the kind of observer to come here 
There's some have already raised the issue about how possible it can be that the sun activity can trickle down to those uh, regional banks observed by Again, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Senna. Um, I wish to invite um, Andrea to react to some of your comments and respond where she can. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, and thank you, Senna, for joining. You also have been uh, uh, active in the legal group. I didn't see you before. Thank you. So, um, as you, uh, we are aware that we were really actually wondering a lot where to start with the sun. Where could it be established legally? And we have looked worldwide, actually, and the ultimate aim is not to have only an office in Washington, D.C. So this is more like a start. That was the idea. But we were looking uh, worldwide uh, with the perfect, uh, I mean, it would be the perfect idea that we could have on every continent uh, an office. Um, but at the moment, we have looked particularly uh, for practical reasons. Where could we establish where we could attract most easily funds? Um, so which legal framework offer itself that governments and uh, foundations um, can most easily support us? So we were looking a lot on, on that topic. Um, but again, there are several European countries we looked. We also looked, of course, several countries um, in, in, in the Asian region. So, but the idea is really ultimately have more like a network, if you want, of different uh, offices at the moment. The idea is to start, um, to start with something practical, um, which is uh, more easy for us to establish, because again, we are all working on a voluntary ba basis. Um, so the law firm uh, which volunteered is also based in the US. Uh, but this doesn't mean that we wouldn't put it, but it's at the moment a very practical uh, question of where we can most effectively be established to help you as quick as possible actually with concrete products and services. So the aim is really to move forward and offer you what we can to get the benefit from fun. And that's also what I think your question is to us. You can understand where can we help you in addition, because each network on its own already offers a lot of services and products. So where can we add value for you on the ground to, to help and support you? Um, yeah, so I hope this answered a bit uh, your question, and maybe Lad wants to add uh, a few things. Lad? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Andrea, and thank you, Senna. Um, yeah, it was good good to have the chance to, to talk in Madrid, and um, uh, I, I do understand kind of your, your frustration. Um, uh, yeah, everything's happening in Washington, and, and not in in other countries. Um, uh, you know, as Andrea said, it, this is you know the establishment, the legal establishment. You know, isn't uh, reflective necessarily of where activities will happen. In fact, it's it's not. It's you know, having the legal base is is just for allowing us to attract funding, and um, you know it it it. You know, is a fact that that four of the five of these funds are are themselves based in in D.C. So, um, of course, everything is is virtual now. Uh, so, and that may be continuing for a while. Um, but I, you know, and your your criticism that you don't feel connected. I also, you know, take 100%. Um, we we haven't done much in terms of communicating uh, in you know getting out to members, and I think. You know that is kind of the next phase of the SAN is to, um, besides these kind of webinars which are kind of internally focused on how we're organizing ourselves, it's time for us to start having webinars where observers, um, you know, will be discussing the issues that matter to them, you know, um, at a little bit more of a of a of a meta level in that we're not talking about a specific project necessarily by a specific fund, but you know, what are the challenges to observers across the board? And, you know, because I think, you know, the idea of the SAN is to bring observers from these different networks together to discuss common problems. So, um, so yeah, you know, definitely you're, you're right. We haven't communicated. We're, we're hoping to, to fix that through sort of like a more of an ongoing series and turn this webinar series into something that's of practical use. 
um, to, to you and to, and to other colleagues. Um, and, and just also note, we, we, you know, uh, unfortunately, a couple of our African colleagues are not, uh, who are on the steering committee are not on this, on this call, but, but they've been also, uh, you know, fundamental to the development of the SAN. So, um, so it hasn't gone without uh, input from, from others. Thank you. Thank you for um, this, these reactions. And I think it's something that we, we need to just um, maybe for now put in the parking lot with the intention of looking and seeing how we deal with these very real issues and perceptions. And maybe as we develop, we may be able to um, clear it up a little better. But I know Julia's hand has been raised. Julia? Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, I have a few things I would like to mention. One is in the past few minutes, I have heard several times like um, that the sun is serving the funds or should be serving the funds. And on the other side, I read a couple of times that you want to serve the observers and the funds, but I think that's really not the same and that has to be distinguished and we can't talk about um, or, or the fund level, uh, the administration unit of the fund, the secretariats of the fund are a different level than the, actually the observers. So at least for the ASNGO network, I think um, we are not considering ourselves as serving the fund. Actually, we are um, following the fund's um, processes, decisions, are um, providing um, input, but we are not serving them. Who we are serving are um, the most vulnerable people in the countries and um, trying to ensure they benefit from the fund. And I think that really has to be distinguished in the discussion, which I couldn't um, see clearly in, in the past webinars and also in this webinar. And then um, regarding membership, I think it's also in the legal arrangements because I think there are also other initiatives, networks that initiated without having legal status. So that's not the only thing which gives credibility, but actually the membership and um, who is contributing to this initiative is also what it gives or what gives credibility. So um, yeah, and regarding the membership, I would just like to say that I think it's a or at least that's my personal opinion, I think it's a bit critical if people are automatically members. So I think um, membership is actually something you sign up to. You say, yeah, I'm committed to support this um, initiative and um, um, something you have to actively <laughs> um, yeah, sign up to, I think, because you might have people in your in your database which might not even know maybe they are members then. And, and also regarding, I have heard you that also individuals can be members, at least from a CSO perspective. I think that's a bit also difficult because uh, on whose behalf is this person speaking? Um, at least for civil society organizations or for our, for the ASNGO NGO network, we're always trying to ensure they are, um, they are speaking on behalf of uh, vulnerable people in their country. They are their voice. They're having no conflict of interest. Um, so I think um, actually the, the having individuals could be uh, members could be a conflict of interest. While I still understand that it's valuable to have experts of climate funds consultants also somewhere in the network. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 a complicated issue which maybe has to be thought about more in detail. Um, those were just a few things I wanted to mention. Hi, this is Julia. May, may I make a comment? Um, to Julia's um, very very astute uh, observation. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and also, I want to digress um, first very quickly to um, Senna. And, uh, we actually do have um, quite diverse representation and a lot from, from the South and the developing countries, as Lad uh, mentioned. 
Um, Saro, who is on our steering committee, is from Nigeria. Um, Guy Patrice is from um, Cameroon. Um, Grace is in the Philippines, and unfortunately, the three of them were not able to be here today. Plus, our uh, membership is very, very heavily from um, developed, uh, developing countries. Um, it is not uh, a full of northern, northern membership. This is why our questionnaire is so very important um, to really identify further and perhaps um, create some statistics and you know all sorts of things that we can share and, and understand our, our, our nascent membership much better. And now I'd like to segue to, to Julia's comments. Um, Julia, you, you're really spot on. So first of all, um, the, there is a distinction between the secretariat level and the NGO network level. And in our listening tour um, in the fall in 2019, when, when we were first introduced to you by Nico, who is from your secretariat, he's your, your manager there, um, we had met with Nico um, knowing that uh, the way that the Secretariat works, the issues for the Secretariat, um, the relationship that the SAN could have with the Secretariat is something quite different from the relationship that we would seek to have with you and your NGO network. Um, and that's the same for the Jeff. We met with the Jeff Secretariat, we met with the Jeff NGO network. And so we, we really do understand that these are two very fundamentally different, um, different constituencies, even though, you know, you're both under adaptation fund, you know, you, you, um, you, you yeah. are very different. Uh, yes. Just one thing, because that's, um, from what I'm hearing, like, when you say our manager, our secretariat, so um, I think that's where the, also the, the difference in understanding is the, the adaptation fund NGO network is an independent initiative. We are working, obviously, we are working together very closely with the funds, uh, with the Adaptation Fund Secretariat, but only this fact that we actually have been approached or that you approached the Fund Secretariat first before approaching the network, and but at the end you want to serve the CSO networks, um, is something I, I don't have very clear. Where, so, so this distinction this, between the funds and the CSO networks, so... Um, we are not receiving any financial support from the adaptation fund. Nothing. But if you want to be the, the like, bring together the, the observers, why are you going through the funds first and not through the observers first? So um, it, it's that's a very good point. Yeah. Very good point and very well taken. Um, and I think that each one of the, the funds and their networks are a bit unique as well. But in, in the context of, of adaptation fund secretariat and adaptation fund NGO network, you're, you're absolutely correct. And so, so from now on going forward, I will make sure that I, I make that distinction very clear. Because, for example, for the SIP, the SIP has observers. Right, they have observers, and they um, go to the board meetings, and they um, help to advise the um, the SIF and the board um, based on their experience with their networks and on the ground and their technical expertise. But that's very different from from what your network is doing. Although I know that recently you had um, you had proposed perhaps having observers to the board of the Adaptation Fund Secretariat. But but your point is very, very well taken and we need to be much more clear about that. Um, and I also wanted to um, you you made another comment about um, um, the members and about um, how they should be very, very important. Um, so our members are very, very important, and that's why we're trying to get to know them more, and we want to engage with them more. Um, and they, they have always, from the beginning, from the foundation of the Sun, sort of been the, the basis of the Sun and what gives it legitimacy. Um, so as we progress, things are getting a little bit um, messy, people have different opinions, and then we're growing in an awkward fashion. But um, the basic foundation of the SAN is its membership. 
Um, it's inclusion, uh, not just of the various constituencies, um, geographic diversity. Um, and I think I'd like to actually very quickly read to you from a from we have some testimonials from our, our membership working group. And you can even see within the small working group, there are different opinions that need to be ironed out, basically about these foundational ideas. So, so are our documents living documents and they change, or do we do we maintain those? initial visions from back in 2015 and 2016. So, for example, um, I have a gentleman by the name of Fiu, um, Matt, I hope I pronounced that right, Matt Tese Elisara. He's the executive director of OLSSI in Samoa. And I would call him a traditionalist. So he says that, um, On membership of the sun, I understand the reason for SIF in creating it was a catalytic attempt to have all observers engaged in climate-related global dialogue to better organize and make useful, relevant, and substantive contributions to the climate discussions at the highest governance level, be it the SIF. Um, the GCF, the GEF, the Adaptation Fund. And here you see he's referring to how uh, for example, the SIF observers do um, engage with the, the secretary and the board of, of the SIF. Um, and then he talks about an application process. I would have a problem if there was an attempt to impose an application process to be a member of the SAN, as this was an inclusive vision um, from the get-go for all observers past and present. So he, for example, wouldn't want to have a formal um, process of application, which is very practical, as you have pointed out. But here's our other steering committee member, Grace Balawag. She's the Director for Indigenous Peoples and Partnerships on Climate um, Change, Forests, and Sustainable Development of Teb Teba Foundation in the Philippines. And this is what she thinks about um, an application. So, um, she says that going forward, it would be more effective um, to be able to review criteria and establish a formal process of application for membership, whether they are previous or current observers to the SIF or other climate funds. She says one problem is that individuals are not necessarily um, representing the same organizations. Here she's talking about members. Um, SAN membership is tied to the person, not the organization. So when the person leaves the organization and moves on, they're still a member of the SAN, but that organization is no longer recognized. So I just want you to know that all of these things that you have raised are being considered. And that's why we felt it was so important to um, devise this survey, which has five parts. It, it talks about um, who are you as a member? It even asks if you'd like to opt out. As you said, maybe they're in the database, they were an observer, they don't want to be any longer. Um, it looks at the governance structure and the membership council and how that is structured and has been working. Should it be tweaked? Um, it looks at um, the song's value addition, and it actually asks for testimonials. Um, you know, what is the song's, uh, what can the song do for you? Um, and uh, I can't think of the other, other, other aspects at the moment. I think one is criteria and one is on elections, which need to be very inclusive and very democratic. So my point is, I want you to know that these are things that are all very much on the table under discussion, and we're really hoping to, to, to sort of crystallize a lot of this and get a much better understanding um, of what our membership is, what it wants to be, and um, be able to convey that to you in a much clearer uh, way um, very soon. So I encourage you and everyone to, to look out for our survey because it will be very important for us to learn more about you. So um, if you have any more questions, um, uh, uh, Julia, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to you about them um, you know, offline. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is the kind of robust discussion that um, is always, that, that institutions like ours can always benefit from. 
I did participate in the discussions earlier in this group, and I do remember the diverse um, perspectives that were brought to the table. And I think that it is reflective of the profound interests people have and, and the value they see in such a, 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 a this in the sun, um, because the issue of um, who is your constituency always comes up. But the, there's also the part, the fact of um, what do I bring to the table in strengthening and supporting this institution? Um, and so I think, um, as we say, as you said, as you go along and the survey will probably help us um, clarify and better understand what is what is desirable, um, what are the pros and cons, and hopefully we will come out of this much better with a clearer um, idea of where we wish to go. Um, I have noticed that we have gone past the um, appointed hour, so I'd like to hand over to Cynthia um, to um, bring us all to a smooth and orderly um, closure of this very important and valuable um, seminar. Cynthia. Thank you very much, Brian, um, and thank you so much for joining us today from uh, St. Lucia and, and telling us about the conditions there. And um, um, we really hope that uh, the economy will be picking up. Um, you know, you, you need so many solutions for, for climate change in these small island states. Um, and so we're so pleased to, to have you as a member of the SAN and, and Hopefully, you can have that discussion with the um, products and services team to see, you know, how how um, how they may be able to help you, advise you, etc. Um, and I also want to thank everyone who has participated today, um, who write to me um, every day um, through. Um, the the very humble Gmail account that we use for this on at this point, um, and uh, for everyone who has attended all of the the webinars thus far, um, we have one more webinar coming up, and this one's going to be a bit different. We're not going to be talking to you about what 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 to this is you know the document. To, this is going to be more about um, feedback that we've been receiving from you. Um, feedback that we want to solicit from you and have it more of a much more organic sort of um, discussion. Um, and uh, so um, please look forward to that. That's in, a, in about two weeks from now, uh, the end of June. And I, I wonder if um, Lad and Andrea have any, any last comments they'd like to make. Thanks, Cynthia. Um... Just to say, uh, appreciate everybody's participation. I think you know this is the kind of thing that we need to to do is to have more outreach, more discussions. Obviously, there are a lot of issues here, and and that that won't be resolved. You know, as I said, we we want to do more outreach, and and uh, you know, for the SAN to be participatory and to actually be of service to the observers. Um, so that's that's our ambition, and um, and you know. Your participation makes it all possible. You, you who are are with us today and and who have been with us for the other webinars. So thank you. Yes, thank you also from my side, and thank you very much also to stay staying longer. <laughs> Above is more than 90 minutes now. We're 10 minutes beyond the time. So thank you very much, and um, please participate at the questionnaire survey of Cynthia, so we can really understand all concern and address them, and also where we can uh, add value. Um, and of course, feel free, as Cynthia said, to also contact us directly. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Cynthia, Andrea, Lad, um, Julia, all, everyone for their comments and their contributions. And stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much to each and everybody. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Bye bye. Merci, au revoir. Thank you.